So thank you so much for this uh, invitation. This is a great honor to be here. Uh, I will be in the interest of time. I understand we're running a bit late, so I'll try to, to be a bit more rapid. Um, well, we want to talk today about uh, voice analysis, which is really um, the technique to analyze the voice and to research deeper levels uh, in the voice than normally meets the eyes. Voice analysis, as you know, is an everyday thing. We all do it all the time. I, I will just start with a brief introduction about voice analysis, just to make sure that we all share the common, uh, the common grounds. So voice analysis is done by everybody, right? Now you're performing three different tasks of voice analysis on me using your own ears, right? You listen to the voice, to the uniqueness of my voice. You listen to the words I'm speaking and you are trying to understand how I feel, right? Most of you do it voluntarily or not. Aware, wearing, uh, awarely or not, uh, you try to assess how stressed I am, how comfortable I feel, how confident I am with what I say. But this is where things get a bit interesting because um, voice, anal voice signature, that's a pretty trivial thing. It's either I'm speaking or someone else is speaking. That's very easy to prove. Speech to text, if the, the system identifies well the words I just said, then the system performs well. But with sentiment analysis and emotion detections, things are a bit more tricky. And why would I say that? Because if I will use a very aggressive voice, right? Then what would the system supposed to say? That was, I was angry. When we meet someone on the street and we don't really remember who that person is, but we go and say, hi, how nice to meet you. So happy to meet you. Are we really happy? So in fact, if you look at the sentiment analysis and the emotion detection, we talk about two different distinct things. We talk about the emotions that we broadcast out and there are the emotions that we try to suppress and hide inside. Nemesisco's technology, as, as uh, said before, we came from the field of trying to build a lie detector. And the, uh, it was very obvious from the day one that if actors would be able to fool the system, then of course the system would be meaningless. And so with that in mind, what we were focusing is always on the unpronounced, on the very short and the very insignificant uh, measurements in the voice. And this is really where we are separated between standard phonetics and uh, LVA. Standard phonetics deals a lot with the cues that we can hear and control. Nemesis LVA deals with things that we cannot control and that we cannot uh, relate to easily. Um, much shorter in times, much shorter in amplitude. And so these are the main elements that we pick up. 151 of them that were identified so far. By the way, only 5% of them are described in the patents and that these patents are pretty old as well. So, the basic understanding was, and that was something that um, was actually quite groundbreaking, I think, because when you look at psychophysiology, psychophysiology, all these emotions, all these emotional responses generate the same response on the body. You will see in the, in the uh, polygraph or GSR, you will see a spike, you will see heightened heart rates, you will see heightened muscle tension, the body prepares to fight or flight. But the voice was actually able to differentiate between these fight and flight and freeze, or the, the aggression versus defensive mechanisms. And this was quite interesting to discover. But that led also to some other uh, discoveries. In fact, the 151 voice biomarkers that we pick up today are able to identify 16 different emotions. And if we look at them, they classify into five major categories. One is the emotion and excitement related parameters. The other one is the logical conflict uh, related parameters. There are indicators that talk about stress and fear. There are multiple ones that talk about stress and fear. There are multiple ones that talk about aggression. And there are the stable state parameters which talk about embarrassment, concentration, anticipation, things that by nature have more latency. In order to make things easier to understand, we've created a concept we call the emotional diamond. The emotional diamond, as you can see, has eight wings and it has energy at the top. Energy is actually a state of awakeness and aggression. 
stress on the other end of the line, which is talking about uh, defensive mechanisms and our desire to escape the scene. Energy would talk about engaging the scene, right? We have emotions versus confidence. We have passion versus thinking. We have concentration versus uneasiness and embarrassment. But as you can see, these all relate to emotions. How can that be transformed into something that deals with risk, right? We started with the lie detection mission. Well, the thing is that everybody that knows anything about lie detection understand that the word is misleading. There is no way to detect lies. There are only ways to identify emotional reactions that come as a subsequent to a stimulus and may be indicative in a certain context to deceptive speaking, which is again an interesting thought because there was a discussion I had with a colleague in the United States a few weeks ago that kind of changed kind of made me change this presentation a bit. Um, and I will talk more about that too. But the idea of any risk assessment system is to understand the homeostasis and then calculate differences from that homeostasis or jumps out of homeostasis. And once we understand the mentality of a person based or as described using the emotional diamond, normal, very, uh, normal behavior, during a speech, we can identify places where it goes very different, and then we can calculate the deviation and assess the risk that is associated with each indication. This is why we prefer to relate to our tools, or we actually insist on relating to our tools as investigation-focused tools and not as lie detectors, um, simply because we want to lead investigators to reveal the unspoken truth and understand the entire situation situation that is um, in the background of the situation. This is actually where I was engaged with a discussion from a fellow um, from a fellow researcher in the United States. And we we're talking about the deceptive speech. And he was trying to, to take a system from us and just use it in the uh, in his laboratory to demonstrate deceptive speech, which I, we just came to realize how much um, how much knowledge is missing when you think about this very simple concept. And just in a short, it's not a very trivial thing. If we just look at the very basic component of understanding if this is an investigation or a casual talk, just like look at it with your knowledge as a professional psychologist and consider the situation where an investigatee comes into the room or when you speak with a fellow um, researcher or a fellow student or a fellow or just a friend. The, the, the very th many different things that are very different to begin with is do I know in advance I will lie. Right? If I go into a room knowing that I will be forced to lie, my entire set of behaviors is very different than if something happens during the call that kind of forced me to lie. There are some things that are pre-planned stories that I create in my head. I was never abused. I was a hero when I was young and it was not a sexual molestation. There are things that I can pre-plan in my mind, but then when I am confronted with those, sometimes I need to fill up the stories or fill up the gap uh, on the fly. These things create very different responses in the way we imagine, in the way we invent, in the way we think and react to the lies. And of course, there is always the consequences of getting caught lying. Will I be slapped in the head? Would I be put in prison? Would I be facing that penalty? These are very different situations that the body responds to in, in, a, in a lie need situation. Of course, if there is no consequences, the reaction would be very minimal and I will talk more about that too. Another thing to consider is the hierarchy. Who reports to who? If I'm lying to my employees, it won't be the same as I will be lying to my boss. If I will be uh, lying to a patient, maybe that's, I don't know, if I may be lying to my kid or to my patient, maybe that would be even okay in a sense in my mind. So again, the response and reaction of that deceptive communication will be different. And then of course, there is my own personal and moral and social scales. Am I maybe a sociopath? Then I have zero consequences or zero fear of lying and I feel zero regret doing so. 
maybe I'm a truth fanatic, and yes, I've met some of these people too. They cannot say they are the Queen of England. I ask them, please lie to me, tell me that you are the Queen of England, and they just cannot do that, which is again a very bad lie to be testing, uh, but we'll talk again more about that. And so I think it is very interesting to understand the moral scale principles, which actually made me dedicate a special slide for it. And this is it. Again, this is a rough um, drawing, just trying to describe the moral scale in terms of Gauss normal distribution, <coughs> where we have 2% of the most the truth fanatics on one hand, 2% of the psychopaths on the other. And most of the population is somewhere on the curve. Um, more and more people are towards the middle, of course, and, and there goes uh, and there it goes, the, the, the higher the, the uh, moral scale um, goes, the distribution change according to the, to the curve, of course. But the principle with that would be that the lower the moral scale of a person is, the higher the jeopardy is, and the higher the stakes must be in order to create a response when talking about deceptive reaction. I have a misspell here. So if you take all these into account, and we haven't even talked about the level of input and noise interference and quality of equipment and audio compression and other irrelevant stimulus that may be, or stimuli that may be in the neighborhood, we understand that this is, voice analysis for risk is not, is not a trivial thing. It is something that has to be based on statistics. It has to be based on understanding and controlling as much of the environment as we can. And it must be something that we learn and profession. And so what we decide, to do, what we do today is we actually, um, in, what we suggest is for, for entities or governmental entities or agencies to start a, a voice analysis unit, which I believe um, people from the, the world of uh, psychology and criminal, criminal psychology can of course be of great value and great additions. And the idea is that once we have this voice analyzers unit that is trained to understand all the ins and outs of voice analysis or a led voice analysis to be precise, um, that type of uh, agency can provide a lot of services to its customers in the organization, both inside and out. To begin with, of course, the trivial one is join any investigation on premise or remote. Today, we can offer solutions that also assist remote investigation. You can log in with, uh, with an iPad, you can log in with a phone. There is no special need for any special equipment. And in fact, as a voice analyzer, you can whisper to the ears of the investigator in the room uh, how the person responds and what should be, what are the indications that we pick up from an ongoing investigation, thereby shortening it dramatically. Another way we can use voice analysis is we can pick up the videos and we can generate analysis uh, that would be simple for the viewers to understand and simple for the court maybe to view and for other stakeholders, maybe generals, maybe higher in the hierarchy that would be um, very easily understood. We can also run automated tests on multiple people, on very large groups, something that is impossible to do today with the existing systems. But since this is an automated system that reports back to a professional at the other end of the, um, the, other end of the line, then every masses can be screened very quickly. We can identify sensitivities, we can identify a real agenda, we can identify loopholes in the past. Everything can be done using a very simple to administer automated type of system with pre-recorded questionnaires to serve exactly the purposes that we want it to serve. If something comes up in these type of interviews, we can use the more professional tools and then use your skills as psychologist to further investigate the person um, seeking for this uh, sensitive position when it really matters. 
Additionally, um, and this has been done by some of our partners and, and uh, users around the world, we analyze the open communication, we analyze uh, converted uh, co undercover communication that is intercepted to assess both the uh, veracity, but also the emotional responses between uh, the two speaking parties or between or of the um, interviewed distant uh, um, party. Also to build this uh, um, psychological profile of our intelligence assets when they are not in direct contact with us. Another thing to do with a system like that would be to um, fight corruption, which I know that's a mission in Gujarat um, area. And I was very proud to learn that this is now being done with LBA solutions. We can offer automations for that too. Another thing that we would like to introduce very quickly is the uh, gatekeeper concept that can help screen people in the uh, airport settings, both landing cards or onboarding cards. We can work with any volume, we can process any type of uh, uh, need using automated solutions. Um, again, this is just a matter of decision um, how to deploy and where. Another thing that can come up as a need for HLS um, sometimes is the automated uh, immigration questionnaires, understanding where your immigrants come from, understand their desires, understand their uh, military involvement, maybe, or criminal history. Sometimes they are losing papers, sometimes there are no papers. Sometimes we just need to know uh, what to expect from our immigrants and make a better decision to follow up or what the case may be. Um, one of uh, my favorite, actually, uh, type of use cases is in the, the police call centers, where we want to make sure that calls are actually being treated fairly and well. And by doing so, we are not measuring the emotional responses of the people reporting catastrophes, right? because these guys will be in a very unique emotional states, many of them will not be familiar with the situation they are facing. But the police officers in the station, they are hearing a lot of um, a lot of stories, they, they are facing a lot of conditions. And sometimes following these guys or following their emotional state would help us understand and make sure that cases are treated as they should be. Um, I just want to say one more thing in regards to the uh, previous uh, session that talked about the unexpressed voice of the victims in, in um, domestic violences. Well, systems like that can in fact identify some unspoken and unexpressed emotional hazards and emotional extreme situations. And by using an ultra sensitive ear, such as the layered voice analysis, uh, we can pick up and, you know, pinpoint conversation that should be followed up, maybe with another call to assess the danger of the reported, uh, of the reporting party, even if they did not express their needs in a, in a very blunt way, or the emotional hazard was not picked easily by the operator. I think last but not least, um, we can also assist, of course, the undercover work, starting from preparing informants to do their work, understand their motivations, understand their sensitivities, understand what exactly do they want to achieve with us. We want to help them implement their new identity sometimes. Uh, and we will monitor communications received with them. To, and then we can identify, of course, unique and extreme reactions that are sometimes uh, indicative of, of uh, speaking under extreme jeopardy or speaking under a threat. Of course, there are many other things uh, voice analysis can do in the world of intelligence, which um, it's not, uh, it's impossible for me to talk about in this type of uh, open conversation. But of course, uh, to the relevant parties, we can talk more about any of these. Thank you very much. Thank you very much um, again for this invitation.